Now we have uh, Dr. Anisur Khudabaksh, who used to be a former professor of, uh, at University of Kalyani, did his PhD in zoology with significant contribution in the field of basic research in homeopathy, including genetic profiling. And he's going to talk to us today on present status of gene regularity hypothesis to explain the molecular mechanism of biological action of homeopathic drugs. I'm really looking forward to this lecture because this is going to prove whether homeopathy does bring about upregulating or downregulation of various genes in various uh, clinical conditions. And uh, I'm looking forward to your talk, sir. Please. Thank you, sir. I feel deeply honored to have an opportunity to share our experiences with the learning gathering here. Actually, I should congratulate the team CCRH for organizing the seminar on a theme which is very relevant and indeed the uh, required thing of today's research. Now what I will do to curtail the talk, I will share my experiences as to how we tried to enhance the quality of research right from the beginning of our research throughout our journey to the end of proposing the hypothesis and telling you the present status which will inspire, I believe, the young generation to follow up such kind of studies. Now actually we have to be concerned with the objections raised by the non-believers, we the scientists have the responsibility to quench their thirst of knowing homeopathy in the proper perspective. The major concerns that are needed today, how the use of ultra high dilution beyond Avogadro's limit where no original drug molecule can theoretically exist or nothing exists, but yet it is claimed to act, we have the responsibility to explain it. The more diluted, the more powerful and long lasting in action. This is an enigma to the non-believers. Then the intricate subject of mechanism of action for molecular basis of medicinal action in all living organisms. Homeopathy does not only work in human beings, it works in all cattle and other animals, also in the microbes and also in plants. So there must be one mechanism that can explain all the molecular mechanisms of action. And the enigma for the non-believers is like yours, like or similis, similibus curentu possible role of homeopathic drug in mind-body interaction. These are the intricate issues on which critical research is demanded, and we the scientists have to answer every question without any figment of doubt. Now, I have great regard for the great scientist Samuel Hannibal. On his birthday, I feel really honored to speak about the genius who actually proposed this kind of, this mode of treatment, which is highly scientific. Even 250 years back, what he realized to, today, we the scientists are trying to prove and prove every point is true. Now, understanding homeopathy needs proper answer for three major issues, you know, physico-chemical aspect of transfer of medicinal property to the vehicle, retention of the property for long. This is in the domain of the physicists. How microdoses of homeopathic drug bring about many chemical, physiological, molecular changes, enabling a recovery in the higher organisms. This is mainly in the domain of us, the molecular biologists, biochemists, physiologists. And to understand the simile principles, including the one like yours, like, and mind-body interaction, psychosomatic aspect in higher mammals, mainly in the domain of molecular biologists again, and medical scientists, including psychologists. 
Now, major arguments. We have to follow the arguments of the non-believers. They say nothing can be present in homeopathic drugs at ultra-high dilutions beyond Avogadro's limit. We have to prove this is not true. There is something in the homeopathic drug of ultra-high dilution. Without existence of the drug materials, homeopathic remedies, particularly the ultra-high dilutions, cannot work. We have to deny this and have to prove that no, they can work even without apparent lack of their existence, what they claim. And claims of efficacy, only placebo effect or psychosomatic effect, not real. This also have, we have to counter. So major research requirements, proof of action, mechanism of action of homeopathic remedy. So to first prove efficacy of homeopathic drug in animal models, in vivo and cultured cells in vitro, keeping suitable controls, that is very important, and by conducting controlled studies to show that homeopathic drug acts beyond any doubt in both systems. If you don't give the drug, Basically, they do not work. If we are using the homeopathic drugs, they are working. And to explain medicinal basis of the high dilutions in scientific terms with evidence-based experimental support, whatever we will talk will be guided and supported by evidential, I mean experimental data. And to explain the possible mechanism of action at the molecular level with experimental support, which is true for all living organisms that respond to homeopathic drugs. Now, to this, having this kind of focus in our mind, for enhancing quality of our works acceptable to science, what we did, we have used the maximum number of scientific protocols ever used from a single biological laboratory in the world in homeopathy research. This we claim with authenticity. Why we have done this? To convince the non-believers that even though we practice and adopt all kinds of scientific protocols, we can show that the homeopathic drugs act. Now we have used models from microbes, bacteriophage, bacteria, yeast, to mammals, mice, rats, and human beings. So you cannot say that it only acts on the human body, it can act on a varied groups of organisms. We have used in vitro cell culture models, particularly in cancer and diabetes, uh, diabetes research, using many types of cancer and normal cells. Now this issue has been taken up by us because some people were advocating that in multiple systems are involved. It is not really necessary. Not always the autonomic nervous system, central nervous system is necessary at all because when we are studying the cells in vitro, the cells in culture, there is no connection of the cells with any central nervous system. Or So whatever the cells are endowed within, the power within, that can be expressed. And the homeopathic drugs, if they can respond in the cell-free system, then we have an idea about the mechanism of action. We are again the first group to have nano-encapsulated homeopathic mother tinctures and nano-precipitated silver from silver nitrate solution by homeopathic mother tinctures in a bid to understand the possible mechanism of action. Why we nano-encapsulated? It was our idea that the very, very small, which cannot be demonstrated normally in human bodies, they cannot be tracked down in human body, bodies. If we can produce nano-sized particles, we can make capsules of the homeopathic mother tinctures and try to tag with certain, say, FITC, so that they can be tagged with certain things which will fluoresce under UV light. Then we can track down them in different tissues in vivo. So what we did is trying to understand the molecular mechanism, where they are going. Are they going and crossing the blood-brain barrier? Are they going to the liver? Or what are they doing? What is the fate of them? So I like to give you an understanding of a very short time 
how we progressed and enhanced the quality of research in our laboratories. We tried to adopt very many clean, uh, experimental processes which were rather alien to us, but we, we had to work hours, months, years together to standardize each and every technique. Some of the techniques required one year to standardize, but we did not fail in my research career of more than 37 years now. We have been able to standardize in the laboratory so many protocols not used by most of the laboratories earlier, particularly the chromosomal aspect, cytogenetical aspect. Chromosomes, because we have cho chosen them, because they are the seat of the genetic material, and because, you know, the repair process is established and some genes are definitely involved. So our target was to, to study the exact mechanism of the genetic material if they're broken down. Is there any intrinsic repair process which could be enhanced by the homeopathic drugs used against shock and injury? So this kind of research you know, the chromosomes, 40 chromosomes, numerous chromosomes, hundreds of plates had to be counted. We sat with the microscopes for hours together to study each of the chromosomes. We had to understand the aberration types. We had to learn how the chromosomes look like normally and where is a small constriction or a lesion on the chromosome and that expert is, is not very in may, very many people not to speak in India, but in many other places. So this is a very tedious study, but we managed to do it in exten quite extensively. We got to used to studying the cytogenetical protocols, the micronuclei, this uh, uh, mitotic divisional plates, the sperm head abnormality, and that is how we improved the understanding of how they are managing the show within the body, how they are repairing the chromosomes. Now this anti-radiation effect of several drugs we have studied afterwards and taking into account large many uh, 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 protocols as in East model we have used in E. coli model, it, this is the unicellular model, East being eukaryotic model, and E. coli being a prokaryotic model, and we have taken into consideration a large number of protocols, and each protocol is scientifically accepted, and most of the world-renowned scientists, they work with these protocols, so they cannot charge that you are doing something which we do not accept. They have to accept the protocols because they are scientifically established. Now, we have shown by our study that there are certain homeopathic drugs which can modulate the expression of the genes which are involved in the repair process. Now, we have been able to show various, but through various protocols, the genetic changes taking place in the genes by using the repair genes, UV repair genes, and we have been able to show how they act and they definitely act. Now, the, everybody knows that the DNA repair mechanism in E. coli is guided by three different genes, UVRA, UVRB, UVRC. If we can show that the placebo cannot modulate these gene expressions of these genes, and the homeopathic drug Arnica Mountain and others, they definitely modulate the expression of the genes, then we would be able to say that these drugs have positive role to play in the repair process. Now again, we have mastered various techniques to learn about in vitro study, cell viability, Tripan blue, MTT assay, LDH activity. This is the study for necrosis, cell cycle by fax, then DNA damage study, gel, single cell gel electrophoresis, comet assay. Now, fax analysis for studying ROS generation, apoptosis, these are all important parameters. And we had to master the art of just, uh, 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 I mean, um, standardizing these protocols. Then, nuclear damage study by fluorescence microscopy.
Duppy, Hicks, different staining techniques we have to standardize. Now, whether the homeopathic drugs in higher dilution can be recognized by the lower forms, that also we have studied and studied with very interesting results. You know, what we do, did is we subjected the E. coli bacteria with sodium arsenite. And the sodium arsenite treatment caused certain changes in the bacteria which are known because they were intoxicated and this, uh, we used arsenicum album 30C, which is supposed to be the antidote and the treatment protocol in homeopathy. And we made placebo 30C. The placebo 30C and also arsenicum album. Not only we stopped there, but we produced some glucose 30C. Why did we do that? Because if arsenic intoxicated microbe, this bacteria could really respond to this, place, this placebo versus arsenicum album 30C versus glucose 30C were important to indicate what are the functions or the genetic expressions after they, these intoxicated bacteria were exposed to these drugs. Placebo did not change anything in them. But very interestingly, the bacteria sensed arsenicum album, which prevented arsenic to get entry into the cell. So they stopped or prevented arsenic to enter into the cells by causing certain genetical changes in the expression of genes which we followed in RSA, RSB, like this. Again, the glucose 30C, they, it played an important role because we know that when arsenic intoxication is there, arsenic has to be expelled out of the body to remove the toxicity from the body of this bacteria. So this is a process where energy is required and ATP will be burnt to ADP. So the glucose will be required to produce because from normal uh, glycolytic processes, one mole of this glucose will produce eight, eight ATP. But when they're intoxicated with arsenicum, only four ATP will be produced. One part will be blocked by the arsenic. Whereas ATP is needed, but ATP is blocked production, glucose will be required more and glucose will be burnt more. So this uh, glucose 30, they acted as a medicine and they invited more of glucose molecules within the body so that glucose would be available in more number to produce more ATP and which will be actually exhausted for expelling. So even bacteria E. coli could produce certain very great experimental data to show that they could differentiate two highly diluted forms of the homeopathy medicine and they produce the gene expressions in a different order. Now, another thing is that we, we discovered it's a very, very, I mean, thought provoking experiment. We standardized the bacteriophages together with the E. coli. This 5174, this is very specific, host specific. It attacks, it is a bacteria having uh, it is a virus or bacteriophage having only single DNA. And this DNA, when it enters into, into the bacterium, they leave their shell protein shed out of the body. So only DNA is piercing and inside. And they get constitutively active there. And they produce and they get inside the host genome. And after taking care of themselves, they try divide, the, to divide. And this division is facilitated by the host genome. And inside the genome, they divide and then they produce the viral protein. And they multiply and the lytic cycle begins. So they produce a plaque, which could be we standardized in about one year. How many viruses together, how many bacteria would produce constant number of plugs? And then we 
expose them to different homeopathic drugs which are claimed to have antiviral efficacy and which are not claimed to have efficacy. And we compared and saw that yes, there are certain homeopathic drugs like belladonna, rustox, aconite, they are showing antiviral efficacy and they are not allowing the virus or bacteria cells to divide inside and making more number of plugs. So, but even Arnica, it does not have normally any antiviral efficacy. It is used for some other, they could not produce so much of this efficacy. And then we targeted the gene, E gene. And we have shown that yes, because restriction enzyme, they produce this, this viral particle. E, E, or this is, this is a particle which is produced by the bacteria that breaks down the DNA. And they produce a rest restriction of the production of the viral, I mean, uh, product, this protein product. That is why they are changed in their expression by different treatment of the homeopathic drugs. So again, we have been able to show that the E gene, particularly when we targeted it, they are showing differential expression. Now the significances of the results. Potentized homeopathy drugs diluted above Avogadro's limit show antiviral effects in E. coli. This may be said that we do not have as yet any antiviral drugs, known antiviral drugs in the allopathic regimen, except that some uh, this, uh, interferons are now used. The potential homeopathic drugs could not alter expression of E gene of 5174, which is already constitutively turned on. The RT-PCR studies showed altered level of mRNA expressions having inactivating effects.